Good morning, everyone. Very welcome this morning, folks, as we join together in worship here at St. Andrew's Middletown. May the congregation remain seated as the choir lead us in worship with Rise Up and Serve. welcome the officers and members of Loch Gall District Loyal Orange Lodge to our service of morning prayer today. Also to Clon McCash Pipe Band and Pride of the Burgess Accordion Band uh, for leading uh, the parade today too. And to any others who are visiting with us, you're very welcome. <coughs> now I'm going to hand over to Stuart and uh, to lead us in our service. Hopefully you all have an order of service or someone next to you you can share with. Good morning. We begin our service this morning with the Christian greeting. The Lord be with you. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. And so let us confess our sins to God our Father as we join together. Heavenly Father, <laughs> we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. 
we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We begin our praise this morning with a very popular and old hymn, Be Thou My Vision, let us stand to sing.
the psalm in alternate half verse. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Gracious and upright is the Lord. He will guide the humble in doing right. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated for our reading. Unfortunately, we don't have Brother Stephen with us this morning. He hasn't been feeling too well, and he sends his apologies that he's not able to be with us. But our worshipful Deputy District Master, Brother Derek Greenaway, will read to us. You can follow the reading, it's on, on your order of service. A reading from St. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25 to verse 37. This is a very well-known passage of scripture. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Here ends our scripture reading. Thank you, Derek. Now I invite our choir to sing to us once again the anthem almost home. Stop me. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all of us gathered here. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray now that as we gather around your word, you will speak to us afresh through it, that our hearts and minds are open to receive you, that we hear your Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's really good to be with you all this morning, folks. And I know it's been three years, I think, since this particular service uh, has taken place last. And thankfully, we're in uh, an area now, uh, certainly around us, that we can meet again uh, as a body like this within church and in the presence of God. I'm sure many of us know a person or persons that we'd say to ourselves, oh no, here's him coming or her coming again. I'd rather not run into that person. Whatever your background or feelings or experience you may have had with that person, oh no, here they come again. And I remember a man back in my hometown many years ago, he's sadly no longer with us, but he actually... Uh, got people uh, traversing the street in the opposite direction or they'd make a diagonal stretch to get away from him to go to the other side of the street and when you met John that was his name you'd have known why John was one of the most negative thinkers that I ever met and the death knell question was you never asked him how are you today John I'm bad I'm bad. And let me tell you why I'm bad as well. And you'd been there, I'm not joking, you've at least an hour on street side hearing all of John's woes. And you can see why people thought, oh no, not John again. I'm sure we all know people like this or maybe for other reasons that we'd rather run away from if we see them coming. You know, the gospel's a bit like this. Many of us steer away from it. We steer away from what the message challenges us with. We might play around with it a little bit. We might see it, know it. But we don't truly engage with what Jesus is asking us to do through the gospel message. And on top of that, to take it to others who have yet to receive it. Derek read for us the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is a familiar uh, piece of scripture to many of us in church today. And it's a parable that comes in two parts. One part is for me and for you, and the other part is for others. And we're going to look at that this morning and what God is saying to us through the parable of the Good Samaritan. This sense within the parable of the gospel and how paramount it is to each and every one of us to receive into our lives. And when we do that, to take it to others, yet to know the Lord. Opening verse, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There are several things in here. And the first part of this parable is the proof and the giving of salvation to all who want it. All need it, but we all have to want it in our lives. This is for me and for you. There are several things within this question that the lawyer asks Jesus that day. First of all, eternal life is real. Do we believe that? Do we believe that this world is not the end, that there's more beyond it, and that eternal life can start now in your life and in my life and go on to be with Jesus forever in heaven one day? Do we want it? is the important question. The alternative to eternal life is eternal death, eternal lostness, eternal separation from God the Father. 
And that's a no-go area. And some of us might say, well, life on earth isn't great anyway. I'm going through a tough time. Things haven't been good for me. I've had a tough, tough life. It's nothing compared to the alternative that awaits for those not receiving Christ. Eternal life is better than this life can ever offer. It's a life of perfection, a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of no pain, no illness, no sorrow. A place that we know in the Bible and God's Word teaches us is called heaven, and it exists. Jesus wouldn't have taught about it if it didn't. And look at the question, what must I do to inherit this eternal life? Note, first of all, the word I. What must I do? No one else can carry us into heaven. You don't depend on anyone else. You may have a God-fearing Christian family you come from. They won't carry you into heaven. You might do all the things that a Christian is supposed to do and yet still not know the Savior. You see, we are responsible for our response to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? No one else can do it for us and must do something we have to do, something that has to happen to get eternal life. And you know the answer to that question, what must I do? You simply do nothing. That's hard to take in, maybe. We don't do anything to inherit eternal life. Jesus died on a cross to open the door for that, that you and I have been substituted from our sins and the wrong things that we do. He took our place to take that all away out of love, out of mercy, out of grace. He didn't have to do it, but he did because he loves us that much. And by that, he offers the forgiveness of those sins, those wrong things that none of us can take away. Therefore, none of us is good enough to go to heaven or gain eternal life. So he takes us as we are, warts and all, sins and all. I died on a cross, he says, for you to take those away. And he has done so. We don't do anything. We simply come to him. And in that question, what must I do? The only thing is to receive it. You don't do anything else. You simply receive it. You ask Jesus, I ask Jesus to forgive my sins. And we are set free if we truthfully come to him. And therefore, given eternal life. And it's a must do. A must do. The lawyer is a smart, upright guy. He's someone who would have been revered in Jesus' society. Someone who had money, security. All the things the world even today would say, oh, that guy's doing okay. He's got money. He's got security. He's upright in society. Surely he's a candidate for eternal life. But the lawyer asks the question, Yes, he's testing Jesus, but he's also testing for the truth, and he's looking to find out what that is. All the, inverted commas, good living in this world, law abiding that we do, church going that we do, giving that we do, does not suffice eternity. It will not secure it without Jesus as Savior. Jesus says to him in verse 26, what is written in the law, young man? What do you read there? The law is the Ten Commandments to every Jew. The Ten Commandments Jesus points to by the answer of the lawyer, you see them summed up in two lines. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus reforms them because no one but no one can keep the Ten Commandments. 
They are a perfect law of a perfect God, perfectly reflecting him. That's why Jesus was sent to you and me, because none of us can keep the law of God. And it's by his death that he opens the door to forgive us and to receive us as his children. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is to know him as your Savior. He's first. He's number one in your life and in my life. We're to love him with our whole being, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Is that where he is today in your life? Is he Savior? Have you met him at the cross, the life-changing power of the cross, that Jesus is number one? That by grace, and only by grace, you and I can attain eternal life. And grace is the free gift of God given to you and to me. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. This life teaches us that everything we get is to be earned or bought for or paid. That's why grace is so difficult for so many to take on board. It's free. Why would Jesus forgive me and give me a free gift into heaven? Because he loves us more than ever we'll imagine. We don't earn our way there. We receive him as our Savior at the cross through the free gift of grace. That is good news. It's the best news we'll ever have in this world. And part two of the story. As part one to us from the Good Samaritan, do we know Christ as Savior, love him, serve him with all our mind, soul, heart, and strength? Now love your neighbor as yourself. You may have had one of these as a boy or a girl when you were younger, a tire swing. Anybody in church ever had a tire swing? <laughs> See a few hands going up there. We had one too, and the, not all the time, but a lot of the time, they seem to flow over water, don't they? Over a little bit of a pond or a river. And the crack is to fall into it, of course, and have others laughing at you. The tire swing was a, a good way of having fun, good, clean fun. It didn't involve a screen or plugging it in. Something you could have outside and have fun. And the best of the fun was that you did fall into a bit of water and got all muck. Go home to mum then and get scolded afterwards. But you know, the gospel's about getting your hands dirty, getting mucked, getting in there. If we claim to know Jesus, we have to serve him. That's an imperative. You don't come to salvation and sit in the fence for the rest of your life. You're enabled to serve. And that's what the second part of the Good Samaritan is about, knowing, first of all, Christ as Savior, and then to go and serve, to bring others into the kingdom of God. You see, the lawyer says in verse 29, he asks Jesus again, who is my neighbor? I'm not quite sure. I want to be sure in this one. Yes, I know the law, and I want to know God. But who is my neighbor? The neighbor is everyone. Not just the fella you share a number with next door, maybe two or one number ahead of you or behind you on your address. Your neighbor is everyone. The person sitting next to you now in church is your neighbor. And we are to serve each other under God. We need to be clear about the gospel. We are to tell it, to share it, and there are three people who come up in this story, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. Some of us might observe the priest. We might say to ourselves, that's up to the minister in the church to bring the gospel to others. Or it's up to the leader of the church or a missionary. Can you imagine how many people don't hear if it's left to just that small group of people? Or like the Levite, Leave that business of sharing the gospel to the do-gooder or the person who's positioned in society in such a way that he or she can do it. And again, many are missed the gospel message. We are all to be involved in sharing Christ if we serve him. 
See, in verse 31, it's by chance a priest is going down the place and sees this man who has been beat up. By chance, God provides the opportunities for us to share him with others. We do not force the gospel on anyone. God provides the openings. Be aware of his voice. Be sensitive to his calling. The opportunities will arise if we pray for them. God will open the door. By chance, God provides the opportunities. And many of us might say, well, it's easy to reach someone of my own ilk, someone of my own community, someone I half know. What if God called you to the stranger? You see, the Samaritan is called to a stranger. The Samaritan is actually an enemy of the man who is lying in the gutter. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get on. He's from a different faith belief even. And he's taking a chance tending to this man. The Samaritan is the guy who is challenged to serve. Outside of his comfort zone, he goes to the ill man. He doesn't have anything special like you and me. But he reaches beyond his comfort zone. He doesn't stand back. Pity moves him upon the man. You and I can say to each other, oh, it's awful to hear about that person or this person. And yet, we don't get involved with helping and bringing the gospel closer to them. We leave it to others. It's easy to sit back and to pity. But this pity moves the Samaritan into helping the man. He is moved into action. He goes the extra mile. Look at verse 34. Bandages him, pours oil into his wounds and wine on them, puts him on his own animal, brings him to an inn and takes care of him. Next day, he takes out two coins, gives them to the innkeeper and says, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever is owed. He attends to the man's immediate needs. Note, he doesn't ram the gospel into him. He's listening to what God is doing in the situation. He attends to the man's immediate needs. And so many of us are keen to speak, but not do. The gospel is two-handed. Yes, we speak it. It is imperative to tell it but we also do it in action with others in help. You see, he comes back. He finishes the message with the man then. He continues on the man's journey. He's sensitive to what God is doing with him. Let's help him initially with his illness, his problem has been beat up. But I'll come back and share with him the love of Christ. There are times when we need to speak yes before the action, but there are many times when we need to deal with action and then bring words to it. They are imperative together in the sharing of the gospel. Others may be involved in that journey too. We may sow, but not reap. But be faithful, the Bible tells us. Make sure you sow. Others may reap, and remember it's God the Spirit that reaps ultimately. The man continues in witness when he goes back to the Samaritan. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Who is truly serving God? The one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. Mercy is a wonderful thing. We have the power to give it or withhold it. And it's the same with the gospel. We have the power to give it or withhold it at our peril. When we are saved by God's grace, we are called to serve. And only by his grace, as him as Savior in our lives, are we effective in the gospel. We cannot serve the Lord properly until we know him. And the same is in reverse. No amount of service without knowing the Lord 
will get us into eternity either. So as I leave you with those thoughts from the Good Samaritan, remember to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything that we know his salvation through the cross, that he is our Savior, he's number one in our lives. And then we are compelled, and I use that word, into service for the Lord. We don't sit back. And we cannot serve God unless we know him. The challenge is what Jesus gives us through the helping of the Good Samaritan. I pray that we know the Lord today as our Savior and that we also serve him in the effect and power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Good Samaritan story. Lord, it is a very familiar story to many of us, and there's so many angles and takes to it, and many people interpret it different ways. But Lord, the truth of what comes through as you challenge the, lorry, lorry, sorry, the lawyer that day that he was to love the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, but also to serve in the gospel. Lord, if we claim to know you today as our Savior, we are compelled to serve. And Lord, if we know you as Savior and aren't serving, help us to do that with your help and guidance. Father, if we're serving you, it's just a veneer if we don't know you. For all the works that we do without you as Savior and knowing you by grace are nothing in front of your eyes. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And it is an inheritance because of the cross. What must I do? Receive you as Savior, Lord. There's nothing else I can do but simply receive you. And I must do it. Or there is no eternal welfare for my soul. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to Reverend Jeffrey for explaining God's Word to us this morning. And we now stand to sing again another very popular hymn, this time a little more recent. And I feel that this hymn is always a, a great expression of our Reformed faith. In Christ alone, let us stand to sing.
standing, we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Sunday after Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us join together in this next collect. O Lord, o Lord our Heavenly Father, Father Almighty and ever living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this new day that we can come together in this place in your name and in freedom to worship you. And we thank you for all those able to join us from home or other places through the wonders of technology. In this her Platinum Jubilee year, we thank you for our gracious sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II, and for the way she has served us so faithfully now for over 70 years. We thank you that she has not wavered in her public declaration of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and her promise all those years ago to maintain the true profession of the gospel. We also give thanks for the support of our family and pray for them as they increasingly share responsibilities in preparation for the future of our nation. We pray that they have wisdom and courage to follow her good example and be guided not by the popular demands and trends of this secular world, but like her and by your holy scriptures, grow in the knowledge and love of our Savior Jesus Christ. Guide and direct her government and all in authority, that they rule for the benefit and well-being of all people and for your glory. 
Father, bless and protect those who serve in all the security forces to defend us from harm. And we pray for peace throughout the world. Thinking of the situation in Ukraine and all who design evil may be converted from their wicked ways and serve you. We pray here in Milltown for our brothers and sisters in our linked diocese of North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where, although it's not widely reported, so many have been made refugees and the victims of extreme violence, as well as having to deal with Ebola and COVID. We also pray for our association with Mission Evanation Fellowship and the Robinsons in Arnhem Land, Australia, and also our partnership with Crosslinks and the Brown family in Italy. Lord of all creation, at this holiday season, we give thanks for times of rest and relaxation, for the break from routine and common tasks, for new places, new people, new experiences. Every part of our life is your concern, and we praise you as we live it to the full. And yet we are mindful for those for whom these joys and pleasures are few, and of those who find it difficult or impossible to get away on holiday. We pray for those who travel home on holiday to be reunited with family and friends, and that all will return from their holiday safely and physically and mentally refreshed. And at this special time of year, Lord, we pray for our Orange Lodges, black preceptories and bands, office bearers and members. We pray for all who lead and that our demonstrations in the coming days will express our reformed Christian faith. And we pray that this will lead others to you and that we would live according to your will at all times. We remember all churches represented here this morning. Bless the clergy, pastors, elders, readers and youth leaders and prosper the reading and preaching of your word. Bless also all who give of their time and talents in support and maintenance, and those who lead our services in music and praise. We remember and ask your blessing on all families of the district and on those whom we love now absent from us. We pray especially for those whom we know and name now quietly in our hearts who are unwell. Those in hospital or in care, and for those undergoing treatment. We pray for our deputy district chaplain this morning and wish him a speedy and full recovery. Send down your blessing on all who labor to relieve suffering. We pray for those who have recently been bereaved and for all who feel lonely, may they know your comforting presence and the support of those who are able to show your compassion and love. We pray for the various summer activities and all who arrange, teach, and participate in them. We thank you for our homes and families and pray for courage and the guidance of your Holy Spirit, teaching us so to follow the pattern of your manhood that we may learn to interpret life in terms of giving not of getting, to be faithful stewards of our time and talents and all that you have entrusted to us, and to use every opportunity of serving the needs of others and advancing your kingdom in the world for the glory of your name. Heavenly Father, you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, that when we meet in his name and pray according to his mind, he will be among us and hear our prayer in love and wisdom, fulfill our desires and give us your greatest gift, which is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and in whose name we pray. Amen. And in conclusion, let us bless each other with the words of the grace. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. <coughs>
and today it is to be split between the Lord Ennis Gill Memorial Orange Society and Irish Church Missions. And I do uh, commend you to give as you can and are able uh, to those worthy causes. Thank you. We're going to stand and sing. Let us sing of his love once again.
Please be seated. Just before the blessing, again, it's been good uh, to be with you all this morning. And thanks to everyone involved in any way uh, during the service and taking part and preparing for it. I want to wish you all a very good Tuesday. And hopefully the weather keeps up the celebrations that everyone will be involved in. Let's pray together. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen.